Welcome back. It was one of the largest non-nuclear blasts in history. The Beirut port explosion in 2021 killed hundreds, injured thousands, and left hundreds of thousands homeless. Two years later, a Canadian family is still fighting for answers. Molly Thomas investigates why it's taking so long and what Canada is doing to help. At first glance, everything appears normal in downtown Beirut these days. Markets are packed, cafes are open, kids are happily playing by the sea. But if you look a little closer, you'll find remnants of an unimaginable catastrophe still lingering more than two years later. This one should be sorted as well. In the heart of the city, you'll find Tracy, a Canadian, and her husband, Paul Najjar, settling back into their old home. Busy parents sorting through a mountain of toys. So this we're gonna keep. No, of course. And put it in her room. It's for their daughter, Alexandra. They lovingly nicknamed Lexu. I think it started at the hospital when I gave birth. I think so, yeah. From the very beginning. From the very beginning, it was uh, Lexu. And now everybody calls her Lexu. She's not a cranky child. Always, always she's in a good mood. So uh, uh, affectious. Affectionate. Yeah, affectionate. Like easy to hug. Yeah, people. easy to hug. You know, just uh, kiss us and uh, say, um, I love you guys. Then, on August 4th, 2020, everything changed. It's an unforgettable scene. A blast so big, it looked like a nuclear bomb with a pressure wave ripping through the capital's core. Tracy and Paul were with three-year-old Alexandra in their living room when they heard an explosion. So I go towards the window and I see the smoke. It was big, huge, huge white huge. smoke. You're seeing this right from your window. Like you're like hundreds of meters away. Yeah, 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 honestly. Yeah, I remember a huge this. plume, white, very white and very tall. Paul and Tracy started to panic, wrongly assuming this was war. We go back to where they were. I just started running toward Alexandra, and I remember grabbing her from here, and I, I heard a strange sound, sort of <laughs> So I turned, I saw the, the, the skirting glasses just go out, you saw the glass yeah, yeah, pull yeah. back. Yeah, exactly like films, like movies. So I saw the glass just pull back, and I remember saying to myself, shit. The blast set off a supersonic shockwave that could be felt in surrounding countries. It was here at the port where a stockpile of ammonium nitrate had exploded that literally leveled neighborhoods. The Najjar family was only one kilometer from ground zero. The force flung Tracy and Alexandra 10 feet across the room. I can see uh, Tracy a bit with a lot of debris on top of her. And so I think you get maybe stronger in these situations, but I started pulling things off. In your the most injured. Yeah, I started seeing blood because I, I was, you know, I, I had opened my head. Paul had this, so he was actually covered in blood as well. This is what the blast did to their apartment. You can see the red blood stains on the floor. Miraculously, Alexandra woke up without even a scratch, but things went downhill fast. And then we start feeling that Lexu is starting to lose conscious and just wake up and lose conscious. Alexandra needed a hospital, but their neighborhood looked more like a war zone. 
there is no more road, so there is no way that we can pass. Outside, sidewalks were bombarded by debris. Cars and ambulances were crushed. There were people screaming, people covered with blood on the roads, people dying on the roads, people badly injured. Tracy was too injured to continue. She begged Paul to go on with their little girl. I'm running with my child for a while. I'm trying to sing her songs so to keep her awake, but I can't walk anymore, I'm too tired. So I stop a, um, a scooter. It's a random person. Random. So imagine that I had to take my badly wounded child on a scooter, you know, which is probably the most unsafe way to transport someone that is uh, injured. Uh, but we have no choice. With so many seeking medical help, they somehow managed to get into a hospital. Doctors found swelling in Alexandra's brain and had to operate. Very quickly, we saw from, from the doctors that the situation was not good. And they told us that there was no signal in the brain. And when this happens, I mean, the chances are uh, extremely, extremely low. The only thing that they could tell us was pray. And the doctors just uh, told us, you guys go sit with her because it's the end and the heart stopped. Alexandra was one of the youngest victims of the Beirut port explosion. Tracy answered my call and I asked her, uh, where is Alexandra? And she told me, uh, that uh, I think we lost her. Alexandra's grandfather, Michelle Awad, struggles to get up some days, knowing he could have given his precious granddaughter a better life. If you ask me if you regret coming back, yes, after what happened to Alexandra, I regret. He's the reason Alexandra was Canadian. Michel had moved to Montreal in 1989 with his wife and young Tracy, fleeing Lebanon civil war. My memories of Canada are, 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 are amazing. It was like freedom, you know. Uh, you go, you sleep, you don't worry about your daughter. Uh, you want to go for a peaceful walk, uh, get a delicious burger or uh, poutine. You talk about this security and this stability. Why leave? Why take Tracy and your family out of there? By 94, a lot of people thought that Lebanon was heading to prosperity and to peace. So the family left Montreal and moved back to Beirut. If for a fraction of a second I thought that I would live to see August 4th, I would never come back. On the fourth of every month, at exactly 6.08 p.m., the time of the blast, mourners gather near the port in Beirut. A show of solidarity for the more than 218 people killed, 7,000 injured, and 300,000 left homeless. Paul and Tracy have thought about moving back to Canada. But for now, they have chosen to stay, to fight for answers, to fight for Alexandra. You see her daughter dying in front of you. I mean, I, I, I cry when remembering this moment, not just because I lost my daughter, but the rage you feel, the frustration you feel. I remember her heart stopping and I was just telling, saying to the doctor, I'm gonna kill them. <laughs> I'm going to kill these people. Coming up, Land tower. outrage spills over to the streets. It just makes you angry that so many people are actually inhuman. When W5 continues. It's been more than two years since the Beirut blast. And Paul and Tracy Najjar are taking their battle to the streets. Alexander Najjar. 
This will not pass, Paul defiantly cries out in the crowd. Their three-year-old daughter, Alexandra, was killed in that explosion. Today, Paul and Tracy are surrounded by survivors of the blast who uniquely understand their pain. All of us, who are still in black. It's been two years. Everyone at this table lost a loved one. For Mariana, it feels like a part of herself is gone. Um, you have a beautiful photo of your sister. Yeah. Uh, tell me about Gaia. She used to sing, she used to talk loudly. Uh, so the house is empty. Tanya lost the love of her life, her husband, Freddie. Have you ever met uh, someone who was the human version of the son? Well, I have, <laughs> Freddie, and I miss him so much. A small but mighty group, they've organized protests in Lebanon, launched a lawsuit abroad. Tracy and Paul won an international probe. I forgot for a long time that I was a survivor. Yeah. And I had, I realized one yeah, day. Yeah, as well. Yeah. This is a fight not only for the people you love, but for all of the survivors that... Yes. And he uh, died, and I survived. So I believe that I owe him the truth. But truth is tough in a country where evidence lies around every corner, and yet no one in power is held responsible. It really looked like a disaster zone. Aya Majzoub lived through the blast. Yeah, I mean, this is what all of this neighborhood looked like after the blast. Everything looked like this? Yeah, pretty much. Wow. It must have hit businesses here so hard. Yeah, most of the businesses here, the bars and the restaurants were completely decimated. What kind of an economic impact, I mean, does that have on a capital city? This was like a thriving place. I think the World Bank estimated that the blast caused about $4 billion in damages. Montreal-born Majzoub wrote a 127-page report for Human Rights Watch, the most detailed public account to date of what happened. After the blast, we started pouring over hundreds of pages of official government, security, military documentation to try to find answers as to who knew about the tons of ammonium nitrate that ended up in Beirut's port. When we talk about the port, how important is it to this city and to this country and the region? The port of Beirut is one of the main gateways for goods to arrive into the country and for goods to be exported out. But it's also become due to bad governance and mismanagement, a way for illicit and dangerous material to enter and leave the country. And that's crucial to how this tragedy unfolded. In September 2013, this ship left the country of Georgia with more than 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate on board, a key chemical in fertilizer or explosives. Two months later, it unexpectedly docked in Beirut's port, supposedly there to pick up more cargo. But instead, the boat was impounded over port fees. The crew was forced to stay on board with the deadly freight. Five months goes by. The ship's captain had his lawyer warn Lebanon's Ministry of Public Works that the ammonium nitrate was very dangerous and highly flammable. Human Rights Watch would later determine the ministry failed to investigate the threat. Is it even allowed to have those kinds of explosives right beside people living in their homes? No, ammonium nitrate that's above a certain nitrogen grade is considered military equipment and, and material used to make weapons. Fast forward to June 2014. In a fateful decision, a judge ordered the ministry to offload the ship's cargo. Port officials eventually chose this warehouse blocks away from people's homes. These pictures show bags of the highly explosive chemical haphazardly stored beside other flammable materials. Shockingly, this is where the explosive sat for six years, a ticking time bomb right beside thousands of unsuspecting residents. We found that officials 
political officials, judicial officials, security officials, and port and customs officials were not only aware of the ammonium nitrate in the port, they were aware of the threat that the ammonium nitrate posed to Beirut and the public. They knew this was dangerous. They knew this was dangerous. And in one of the reports that was sent to the president uh, and the prime minister, it clearly said that if this were to blow up, it would destroy the city. These people in power were elected to protect their citizens. And that's not happening. No. Not only did they fail to protect their citizens, they killed their citizens. What happened in the 4th of August is that the corruption literally exploded in our faces. Literally exploded in our faces. Riyad Kobesi is one of the country's top investigative journalists. For more than a decade, he's been reporting on a culture of corruption at the port of Beirut, where bribery is the focus, not safety. So long before the blast, you knew there were huge problems in the port. Yeah, I knew that, that there's a huge problem when it comes to corruption, but I didn't expect that they will be that stupid to store this amount of ammonium nitrate there. They didn't have enough time to find a solution for this 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate. What do you mean by that? That they, they didn't care. They didn't care that something so busy, dangerous... They were busy taking bribes and stealing to collect money for the politicians' pockets. At first, it looked like the Lebanese government wanted answers. One of the country's top judges tried to lay charges against several high-profile politicians, but that judge was removed following political interference in the file. The political class has done everything in their power to ensure that those investigations go nowhere. They have filed legal challenge after legal challenge against the judge leading the investigation. In February 2021, another judge took over. He laid more serious charges that politicians have managed to stall. The judge is now accused of mishandling the investigation. Do you have any hope, Aya? That In a domestic investigation? Yeah. No. 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 Tracy and Paul are also losing hope. When you saw the documentation of how many people in power knew about those explosives for years, how did that make you feel as citizens? Very angry. It just makes you angry that so many people are actually inhuman. Has anybody even called to say we're sorry for your loss? No. No one. Critics say the blast is just a microcosm of Lebanon's broken system, ruled by politicians with complete impunity. So then what prevents another huge blast from happening? Nothing. Injuring innocent people. Nothing. nothing killing them. Nothing. The system is stronger than the blast. W5 made multiple attempts to contact the two politicians still in power who are facing homicide charges related to the blast. Neither would pick up our calls. Another former Minister of Public Works, Yusuf Fanenos, referred us to his lawyer who writes, we categorically deny this allegation of homicide, claiming their client only became a minister in 2016 after the chemicals were stored unsafely and that he wasn't notified of the extent of the risk it was posing. <laughs> Little solace for grieving families who openly air their frustrations in front of the port, yet feel ignored by their government. In your mind, is the only way forward an international independent investigation? One of the things that the Human Rights Council at the UN does is form these fact-finding bodies and international investigations to look into situations of human rights abuses. But no country has yet been willing to lead on this issue. Heartbreaking for the Najjar family, whose daughter has become the symbol of the ongoing fight for justice. What's honestly demotivating and sad, it's the international countries. Lebanese people, I understand, but you know, France, the States, European countries, even Canada, we're not getting any support from, from, from the government. Do you feel forgotten? A bit. Yeah. 
we understand their frustration and their need to seek justice. Chantal Chastanet was Canada's ambassador to Lebanon for two years following the blast. Canada, along with the other countries, still feel strongly that the best route for the moment is through a credible, impartial, transparent investigation, national investigation. Within the country? Within the country. So you do believe that that's possible? Yeah, I mean, you have to continue to push for it. But what happens when that country wipes its hands? For the two years I've been there, I've been raising it in every meeting I've had with uh, Lebanese authorities, and uh, we will continue to do so. As they wait for answers that may never come, Tracy and Paul are making new memories in their old home, settling back in with a baby boy. <laughs> Axel will never replace Alexandra, but he's helping his parents dream again, reclaiming this space and naming it the house of Alexandra. That's the, the house of Alexandra. Her room, I, I, I see her walking here, Everywhere. I see her on my bed, I see her playing outside. It's a beautiful way to think about it, but I, I, I imagine that must be terribly but hard at the same time. At, at first, we thought about selling the house, yeah. and then we went through a lot of pain and anger and frustration uh, because of these criminals. We, we just can't let them take our house and the house of Alexandra as well. News reports out of Lebanon say at least eight more senior and mid-ranking officials have been charged since a judge resumed his investigation.